Well, let me pray for us, and we'll be in the book of Joel this evening. Father, we thank you for all of your word. We thank you for the Old Testament as well as the New and the way that you have unfolded the truth about who you are and how we can know you and how in Christ we can be saved. We thank you that you have done that in the way that you have, beginning in Genesis and moving forward through the entire drama, the unfolding narrative of the Old Testament, culminating, Father, in Jesus, the the beautiful opening line of the New Testament, linking him with Abraham, with David, and then the Gospels, Lord, and the explanation of New Covenant theology and the letters that follow. We thank you for your word, for all of it, Lord. And this evening, as we turn our attention to the book of Joel, would you give us insight, Father? Would you warm our hearts as we read through this book? Would you convict us and challenge us, Lord? And would you make us more like Christ as a result? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Remember um, years ago in seminary, I had a professor, older gentleman, and he told us the story of the one and only time that he walked out of a church service. Um, he happened to be traveling. I think he was uh, teaching somewhere and traveling, and so he found a a church that seemed solid near where he was staying and went and attended. And it happened to be on September 16th, uh, 2001. September 16, 2001. So that means that five days earlier, what had happened? Um, The most uh, perhaps significant, uh, deadly terror attack ever on America, on our soil. And so he went into the service that day, obviously expecting to hear from God's word some encouragement, some perspective on what had happened. Well, he said the service progressed from the call to worship to the welcome to singing, announcements, and absolutely no mention at all of that monumental event that 100% of the people in the room were thinking about, worried about. He said he got about five minutes into the sermon, and the fellow just picked up in the series where they had left off the Sunday before when he realized that they were going to get through this whole service without ever mentioning the terrorist attack. He got up, and he walked out, and he said that's the one and only time that he's ever walked out of a service, because he found that to be so unpastoral, insensitive, unwise, and shocking that a church the Sunday after such an event wouldn't offer hope and perspective and healing from the Word of God about that event that was so significant in the nation's history. Well, the prophet Joel was not going to make the same mistake. Something had recently happened in Israel that was um, just as pressing on the minds of all in the land. It was just as difficult. It had far-reaching consequences. It equaled something like total devastation in a real way. And so he used that event to talk about the Lord's plan for Israel. He recognized by the influence of the Holy Spirit that this event was symbolic of events that would come both in the near future for Israel and in the distant future for Israel. And so, in essence, he preached about it. He talked about God's sovereignty and what uh, God in his providence was doing and would do relative to Israel. Israel had been ravaged by a plague of locusts. If you know anything about locusts, you can look this up on YouTube. This happens still to this day in some parts of the world. 
Um, the breeding of the locust sometimes gets out of hand, and there are uh, orders of magnitude more than there usually are. And the difference between a locust and a grasshopper is uh, nothing. Um, the difference is their behavior. If you get too many of them too tightly packed together, their behavior changes. They begin feeding off of cues in each other, and their behavior becomes strange and robotic and destructive. Uh, you can find uh, documentaries about this <clears throat> for free on YouTube. And so from time to time, locusts come in swarms, and they can decimate very large areas. The damage that they can do is unbelievable. It looks like a forest fire has gone through an area. Um, the sun can quite literally be blackened out by massive clouds of them coming overhead. They land, and in just a matter of hours or days, they eat every green thing. They can destroy everything in the path where they march. Well, this had happened in Israel. A large portion of the land had been utterly destroyed, something that would take at least two years for the land to recover from um, in its growing cycles. And so the people were um, destitute. This was very dangerous. Their food supply had been cut short. In fact, it was so bad they had no food, not even enough grain or wine to make the daily offerings, grain offerings and drink offerings in the temple. They couldn't even worship as they were commanded to do because there was literally not enough grain for them to go and, and make these offerings. All of life had now been interrupted and would be for the next couple of years. The land was broken. So the people were broken. When Joel spoke, they were all listening because they were all feeling the effects of this shattering event on the land, on their nation, and on themselves personally. So Joel used that devastation at the leading of the Spirit to speak about both the judgment of God and the salvation of God. He not only gave perspective, but he offered hope. Hope in the short run and hope in the long run. Hope eternal. He saw this devastation as a symbolic precursor to the type of destruction that God would one day bring for sin. And he saw the restoration of the land as a precursor of the type of blessing that God would one day pour out on the land and on the people. Just as God would send rain to rejuvenate the people's land for more growing seasons, so he would one day send his spirit to rejuvenate the people's hearts forever. What Joel is perhaps most known for in our day is a quote from the end of Joel 2 that gets quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost to explain what's happening when the Holy Spirit is poured out and people begin speaking in languages that they had not studied and hadn't previously known. Peter says, ah, this is the beginning of a fulfillment. And he quotes a few verses that we're going to read together momentarily. Joel is also known as the book about the day of the Lord. Not the Lord's day. That's the term we use to mean Sunday, the day that Christians have traditionally worshipped since Jesus rose on a Sunday those 2,000, some, uh, those 2000 years ago, but rather the day of the Lord. And we'll define that a little bit as we go. Um, we really don't know a lot about Joel, either the man or the background of his short book. His name, uh, Joel, means Yahweh is God. Um, it is pointing to God's sovereignty. He is the one who reigns, and that's an appropriate title. Um, it's an appropriate name for a prophet, and it's an appropriate title for his book. Uh, like most of the prophets, his message is concerned with God's sovereign rule over everything, even difficult circumstances like devastation by locusts, like, I believe, he's talking about a soon-coming invasion of an army and God's judgment in the end. Well, in Joel, we'll see that God is sovereign over nature, he's sovereign over the nation of Israel, and he's sovereign over all the nations of the world. And I think that is the progression of the book. 
In fact, the three chapters of the book might be seen as concentric circles, starting with this natural disaster in chapter 1, moving to what that disaster symbolizes for the nation of Israel in chapter 2, and then finishing with God's judgment on the unrepentant among all nations of the world in chapter 3. And so I think it is a display of his sovereign rule moving outward in those concentric circles from the past, from Israel's perspective as they first read Joel, to the present or the near future with a soon coming invasion, and finally out to the far future, from a natural disaster to a national disaster to global judgment and salvation. All of that in three short chapters. Well, hard to know when Joel wrote, arguments have been made heatedly for multiple different dates, but they span from around 835 BC all the way up to 500 BC and even more recently. But the truth is none of the arguments are convincing to me. Meaning, I don't think we're supposed to know when Joel wrote his book. God in his wisdom chose not to give us a lot of clear and obvious chronological historical markers. And I think when that's the case, it's better for us um, to side with those like John Calvin, who said, as there is no certainty, it's better to leave the time in which Joel taught undecided. And as we shall see, this is of no great importance. Meaning the message of Joel isn't linked to one specific year or the reign of one specific king. For instance, no kings are mentioned in Joel. And people try to date the book based on that. Well, it must have been so early. Perhaps it was when one of the kings was, was put into power who was so young that the king did not matter yet. And, or maybe it was after the exile when there were no more kings reigning in Israel. Those are arguments from silence, and they're thin arguments at best. Um, many believe that Joel was written quite early, um, in the 830s or so. Um, They believe that because of where it sits canonically, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Um, It's between Hosea and um, uh, Amos. And uh, And these books are written earlier, and so they believe that that's intentional, and that's very possible. Um, uh, and I tend to think it was written earlier in the 800s BC or 700s BC, and therefore chapter 2 is looking forward to one of the invasions that we know happened historically in the 700s or um, the, the early 500s. But we cannot be certain, and it doesn't change the meaning of the book, depending on where we date it. And so um, Joel does mention Judah six times, that's the southern kingdom in Israel. He also mentions Jerusalem another six times. So he was very likely living and writing in the southern kingdom of Judah, and some argue perhaps he even lived in Jerusalem. That's very possible. But beyond this, we just don't know. And so it's better for us not to guess and and build a, a series of interpretations based on dating that's just so uncertain. If God didn't tell us, then we don't need to know. And so Um, But as far as I know, no serious claims have been made even by uh, more liberally leaning scholars to discredit the book of Joel and to say that it's not part of the canon. It's been included in the canon since uh, earliest days. So we take it as the word of God. Now, what is the theme of Joel? I already mentioned this phrase, the day of the Lord. It comes up over and over through the book of Joel, the day of the Lord, that specific phrase, as well as just referring to that day more generally. And um, Dr. Constable, um, whose notes are available for free online, uh, I highly recommend you use those. It's, uh, you can look them up. It's called Sonic Light um, Constable. You can Google for that and find his notes on all 66 books of the Bible. And um, many of them are hundreds and hundreds of pages per book. And he's always made them available for free online. And Plano Bible Chapel, the church that he was long associated with, has put those up graciously on their website in PDF form so you can download them and in HTML format so you can read them online. And they're wonderful um, commentaries, especially for his historical and background information. 
So let's just uh, write that down. Sonic Light, Dr. Constable, wonderful resource. He says here, don't agree with all of his interpretations, but he's solid. He loves the Lord, and um, especially his background material is outstanding. But he says, um, um, Joel describes each of these devastations as the day of the Lord. The term itself refers to a time when God had been or would be controlling events for Israel in an unusually direct way. It was his day in the sense that at those times, Yahweh was and would be especially prominent in what happened. God revealed his plans for the future simply at first through the writing prophets. God does not overload us with too much information all at once. In later prophetical books, we'll get more detail. In all the prophetical books, the day of the Lord refers to a time of judgment and or blessing. I think that's a very good, simple, non-technical way to explain that. The day of the Lord refers to a time when God had been or would be controlling events for Israel in an unusually direct way. Ultimately, the day of the Lord seems to be that day when Christ returns. It's that day when all judgment and salvation are final at the consummation of the age. But days before then, where God is clearly at work in judgment or salvation, also can be referred to as the day of the Lord. Um, They're like um, tremors (laughs) leading up to the big quake. Um, They're like foothills visible in the distance. You can see them uh, going up, and then there's the main peak in the background. The day of the Lord is like that, and there are three days of the Lord, if you will, in the book of Joel. So if I were to give you a simple outline of the book of Joel to help you as you read it, I would say that um, chapter 1 is a day of the Lord past, a day of the Lord past past from the perspective of Joel and his readers. It's this plague of locusts. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 27, would be a day of the Lord present. It was a day of the Lord that was uh, upon them or soon coming. And I think then that chapter 2, verse 28 to the end of chapter 3 could be called the day of the Lord future a day of the Lord past, a day of the Lord present, and the day of the Lord future. Now, um, this book is just short enough at three chapters that um, we're going to read through it. I think we have time for that. And so I'm going to read through it and just make a few comments as we go. And I think that that will uh, do better than me teaching it as we sometimes do with some of the longer Books. I want you to hear from Joel as he wrote to Israel. So let's start with chapter 1, a day of the Lord past. Joel 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number, Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. I believe that he is referring to an actual horde of locusts, metaphorically as an army. Armies are more than once described like a swarm of locusts. Back in Judges chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, um, you can read that on your own, but this is uh, the precursor to Midian being called as a judge. 
uh, I'm sorry, to Gideon being called as a judge because the Amalekites and the Midianites kept marching across Israel around the time of the harvest to steal their bounty, and they were described as a horde of locusts covering the hills. So this is a picture. I believe that Joel is talking about a real swarm of locusts and saying that they came like an invading army. Verse 8, lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up and the oil languishes. These are all symbols of God's blessing when they are plentiful, promised to Israel about the time when they would inherit the land. Well, now they're all cut off. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. So what do they do about this? Well, uh, like a good preacher, he turns now to application. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in. Pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Fasting typically went hand in hand with praying. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. You might underline that in your Bible for at key points throughout the book of Joel, the response of the people of God is to cry out to the Lord. Uh, This is what we do in response to natural disasters. It's what we do in response to national disasters. And it's what we do in response to global disasters. We recognize that God is still on his throne, and as his people, we cry out to him. Verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are torn down because the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there's no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. What a graphic picture of the livestock um, complaining loudly in the fields because they're hungry and wasting away. To you, O Lord, I call. Verse 19, you might underline that. To you, O Lord, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Whether he means that this devastation by the locusts is so severe that it looks like a forest fire or whether he means that on the heels of this an actual fire has come through, we don't know. But it scarcely matters because the physical devastation is so severe that man and beast alike are languishing with nothing to do but call on the Lord. Chapter 2 now, I believe, and scholars debate this, some would say that he's continuing to talk about this um, locust plague in just heightened terms. I tend to think that he's talking about an invasion of an army that is coming upon them in real time, at the time that he's writing, or in the near future. But listen to chapter 2, a day of the Lord, present. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. So again, the locust plague was a day of the Lord. This invasion that they're facing in their time is a sense of the day of the Lord. It's just not yet the ultimate day of the Lord. But it is a time that Joel recognizes as judgment from the hand of God. And it is therefore part of the day of the Lord. 
He says it's a day, verse 2, of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Um, Their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and, <coughs> excuse me, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. You see why some scholars would say, no, this is a continuation of the description of the locust, but in a heightened way. But I think that um, as he's describing the locusts in chapter 1, he is already, I think by the inspiration of the Spirit, I think that he knows that this is a precursor. I think that he knows that this is a symbolic um, occurrence pointing forward to a military invasion. So I tend to think that here in chapter 2, he's doing both. He is describing this plague of locusts in a, in a heightened way, comparing them to an army. But I think he is also talking about a real army that came against them. And if you go and read about the invasions, for instance, of the Assyrian army or the Babylonian army, when they would overwhelm smaller nations, it sounds exactly like a swarm of locusts. They would just come en masse and overwhelm their smaller enemies and destroy everything in their wake. Oftentimes, these uh, larger powers would give nations or cities or regions an opportunity to become their vassal, to submit to them and pay tribute, and in essence, fly their flag. And if they did then they might prosper them. They wouldn't destroy them. They would just tax them heavily, (laughs) but generally leave them alone. If they didn't, then they would oftentimes leave a wake of destruction in their path just to send a message for others in their kingdom or the lands that they hope to conquer next. So I believe that um, Joel is doing both. I think he is still speaking of these locusts, but I think he is also speaking of the military invasion that they are experiencing or will experience soon. And I don't know if that would have been the Assyrian invasion or the Babylonian invasion um, or another smaller invasion, but I think that he is comparing the two. Look at verse 6 of chapter 2. Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Even marchers, I'm sorry, each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened. And the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? When God moves in judgment upon those individuals and nations who refuse to repent, That day is a great and terrible day, and any attempt at human resistance is utterly futile. And this is what Joel is explaining. You say, isn't that a bit cruel for him to do to a nation that's just experienced this national disaster? Well, yes and no. You see, Israel continually, repeatedly turned her back on God. No sooner would God uh, spare them and deliver them from their enemies than would Israel turn back to rife idolatry and all that it entailed, worshiping the gods of the Canaanites, worshiping Molech and a host of others, including worship, in air quotes, that involved things like uh, human or child sacrifice. 
And so Israel, even God's wonderfully blessed people, repeatedly in vast numbers, the majority of them, would turn their backs on God and uh, worship idols. God would plead with them and remind them of his covenant, remind them that he would discipline them if they didn't turn back to him. And so, in fact, it's the most loving thing that Joel can do to say, do you see the utter destruction that these locusts have brought on us? If we don't repent of our sins and turn back to Yahweh as our loving God, he's going to bring a destruction on us that will be far worse. It won't be at the hands of locusts. It will be at the hands of an invading horde. It won't just be a couple of years of cleanup and regrowth. It might be something like 70 years of captivity in a foreign land. You see, Joel is pointing to something bad and saying God is willing to forgive us and restore us. But we need to repent of our sins. We need to come to him <clears throat> on his terms. It's actually the most loving thing that we can do to be honest about sin and its consequences. It's been well said that if someone is standing in the street and a car is barreling down on them, that car is a long way off. You might talk calmly. If it's getting a little closer, you might have to raise your voice. If it's about to hit them, you might shout and push them. And the same is true when someone is stubbornly refusing God's salvation in Christ. When they are spurning the grace that God has held forth for so long. There comes a point to tell them clearly, I fear for you. And this is what Joel is doing. He's giving them perspective. Verse 12, here's the amazing part. Lest you think Joel is rubbing salt in a wound. No, he's offering living water to those that are dying of dehydration. He says, yet even now, 2.12, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Boy, they were in the streets. They were putting ashes on their head. They were tearing their clothes. They were putting on sackcloth. And Joel says, that's not enough. That's not even the point. You are expressively mourning the loss of your food, of your crops, of your comfort. You need to tear your heart, not your clothes. You need to come to God mourning your sin, not your circumstances. You need to call out to him for his grace, not just for new crops. Rend your hearts, not your garments, verse 13. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. This is beautiful. There is one and only one way that you and I, as well as any Israelite, will ever be spared from the coming judgment of God on sin. And that is to mourn over our sin, to repent of that sin, and to turn in faith to Christ. It's to repent and believe. And Joel, as a good preacher, has not only laid, he's not only brought... Um, perspective to their current circumstances. He's not only warned them about the coming judgment of God, he's not only applying his message and telling them to cry out to God, but he's now holding forth the offer of salvation and telling them that when they rip their hearts instead of their coats and turn to the Lord in mourning and repentance, they will be saved. Joel is a wonderful evangelistic expositor. Look at verse 14, chapter 2. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Joel says there may even be hope for us as a nation. God may, may stab off this invasion. 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. He says the time is too short and the matter is too important. If you're on your honeymoon, come home. We've got praying to do. We've got repenting to do before the Lord. Verse 17, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep 
and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Isn't this incredible? He's instructing the people to pray to the Lord in light of God's glory and working on their behalf for the sake of his name among the nations. It's a very good way for us to think. Verse 18, listen. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. And the Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. God has heard their prayer. He's responding to their, rep- their repentance. Verse 20, I will remove the northerner far from you and drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field. Remember when we saw the beasts in the field that were whining because their stomachs hurt from hunger? The Lord has a promise even for them. Fear not, beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. Here's a promise. God has already begun to restore their fortunes, and he says that he will do so. Now, wait a minute. Is God talking about an actual army that he will banish back to the north from whence they came, whether the Assyrians or the Babylonians? Or is he talking about healing their land agriculturally from the locusts? My answer to you, it will be unsatisfactory to some of you, is yes. (laughs) Yes, and I think that that's how prophetic literature works. I think that he is speaking of what has just happened in their land. And what it points to that's happening in the present or the near future, and the answer is that one stands for the other. And I think that he's speaking of both at the same time. And I think that God does heal their land after this swarm of locusts. He does give them a bumper crop the next year with just enough rain, early rains, late rains, enough for them to grow a season's worth of food. And I think that God also, I'm reading my Old Testament, delivered the nation of Israel multiple times from their conquerors, even restoring them back to their land, as we talked about in Ezra and Nehemiah, after they were banished out to Babylon. They did come back and rebuild their temple. They did come back and rebuild their walls. And so I think that Joel is speaking of both deliverance from the natural disaster from which they were suffering and deliverance from the national disaster disaster that was coming upon them in judgment. Verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. You can hear a heightening of the language here. The language is sort of focusing its lens on God and his glories and on promises that aren't for just now, but for the future as well. My people shall never again be put to shame. And I think that we have our third and final transition with chapter 2, verse 28. We go from a day of the Lord past in chapter 1 to a day of the Lord Lord future and 228 to 321 look at verse 28 it shall come to pass afterward so we're looking forward to the future that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh 
Up until that time, God's Spirit was given only temporarily and only to certain individuals who were uniquely empowered by God for certain roles of service, like his kings or his prophets at times. But here is a prophecy that one day God will pour out his Spirit more generally, more broadly. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Well, even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke, and the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So notice that these are things yet future from the perspective of Joel, and these are things that will happen before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, which is in a time yet, yet future, (laughs) more future even than the pouring out of the Spirit. And I bring that up for a reason, because when we get to Joel 2, and I'll turn there in a moment, Joel, uh, Peter cites Joel 2 in his sermon in Acts 2 and says that uh, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. But what I see here is two different things. I see an outpouring of the Spirit, and then I see later the great and awesome day of the Lord coming. Um, The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. There is an outpouring of the Spirit. Then there are these celestial interruptions that are um, clearly visible. Uh, And all of that happens before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So it seems to me that even here in the book of Joel, uh, there is a staggered fulfillment of these realities, not something that happens all at once in a pinpoint. Verse 32, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that's a line to have underlined in your Bible. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. There is a promise of salvation here for those who begin to experience these things. Um, And those who see this judgment of God coming and repent will be saved. Now, turn with me to Joel chapter 2 real quick. Um, and I'll show you the, I'm sorry, to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit has come just as Jesus has promised. He said, it's actually better for you that I go away because I will send another helper. He will be with you. He will um, live in you. And um, sure enough, Jesus ascends. They go back to the, uh, an upper room in the city and the Spirit comes. It's described as bits of fire that come down as though resting on their heads And they begin speaking in languages that they had not learned in the natural way. And they begin preaching in this way as well to the people, to people um, who know that guy doesn't speak my far-flung language. What is happening? This is clearly a linguistic miracle. Um, And so Peter stands up to explain this. Acts 2, 14, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. I always pause there and think it's funny. Like if it was the ninth hour of the day, would we expect them to be drunk? But not because it's the third? But that's not what he means. I think he's just saying you can see that they're here in their right mind. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And here we go. In the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, etc. It's what I just read to you. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 2.22, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Well, Peter is just as pointed in his preaching as Joel was in his. And he says, this is all part of the plan of God. This is exactly what God told us through the prophet Joel. And um, you killed the son of God. 
He's going to call them to repent as well. Now, what about these uh, cosmic disturbances? What about Joel 2, 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Well, turn with me real quick to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and look at verse 29. <clears throat> Here Jesus is talking about the events of the end. And he uses very similar language. Matthew 24, starting in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now go to Revelation with me. We'll go all the way to the end. If these things are so, if these signs accompany um, the, the day of the Lord, the final day of judgment and salvation, then we would expect to read about them in the book of Revelation, the longest and clearest vision of the events of the end. And not surprisingly, we do. Go to chapter 6, verse 12. Um, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth. Now go to chapter 8, verse 12. We see something similar. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise, a third of the night. So I believe that Joel is speaking of these things together. I don't think that Joel had any clear picture at all of the exact timeline of the unfolding of these events. I don't think any of the Old Testament prophets did. We're told that as New Covenant believers, we get to see many things that they longed to know and see and were not able. But God gave them a sketch of this and gave them many pieces. From their perspective far off, it looked like one picture, like a couple of mountain ranges there all together. But when you get much closer, you realize, oh, wow, from here I can see that there's miles between each of these ranges with deep valleys in between I didn't even know were there. And so it was when we moved into the New Testament. And in the light of Christ and the Spirit's guidance, what we see there and the, and the fully realized theology of the New Testament is a lot more detail filled in about the end. And um, I believe that <clears throat> Peter was absolutely right, that Jesus' ascension and sending of the Spirit was the beginning of this fulfillment. It was the inauguration of the church age. This is the new covenant era and these, um, I believe that the day of the Lord was inaugurated in a new way. It was a domino push that can't be unpushed, if you will. But I believe that we still look forward to the events described by Jesus in Matthew 24 and by John in Revelation, uh, well, all of Revelation. I took a futurist approach there. I believe that's the right way to read that book. And um, Joel has been... It has been revealed to him by the Lord that these things will come. And he's explaining to Israel that God, who is sovereign over natural disasters like a locust plague and is sovereign over national disasters like the uh, Assyrians and the Babylonians marching on them, will also be just as sovereign over that great and global day of the Lord when God saves all who call on him and judges all those who who reject him. And this is what he turns to now. Look now at chapter 3. Behold, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I'll enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and divided up my land. And have cast lots for my people, and have traded a boy for a prostitute, and have sold a girl for wine, and have drunk it. 
What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the great regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you're paying me back, I will return your payment on your own head swiftly and speedily. For you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich treasures into your temples. You have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. That mention of the Greeks, by the way, is why some people date this book in the 500s or even early 400s BC. But the Greeks were spoken of much, much earlier as well. Verse 7, Behold, I will stir them up from the place to which you have sold them, and I will return your payment on your head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a nation far away. For the Lord has spoken. And he shifts back into this um, beautiful poetry. Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. The opposite of what Israel will do in the end. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations. Gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. So this indicates that he is writing now of that day in the end when these things are fulfilled. I believe this is a final rebellion against the Lord described in the book of Revelation. Perhaps there in the beginning of uh, chapter 20. By the time we get to chapters 19 and 20, we see this final rebellion that is immediately put down by the Lord before establishing his kingdom. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to his people a stronghold to the people of Israel. Verse 17, So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. You'll notice this language of physical blessing in the land of Israel there in Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Um, For me, I put this together with what I see in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel and in a lot of other passages in the Old Testament. I believe that there will be something of an earthly millennial kingdom in which God will fulfill his promises to Israel like this in a very literal way. Other scholars would say, no, this is fulfilled in a spiritual way in the hearts of God's people as he reigns over them. Um, I, I, I cannot find that interpretation satisfying. To me, it doesn't make enough sense of enough biblical data. There's so much and so many of these prophets that talk about the land and what seems to be a literal fulfillment, a literal fulfillment that Jesus' disciples certainly expected and asked him about. And rather than correcting their theology, Jesus seemed to embrace that and simply said, well, it's not for you to know yet when God will restore the kingdom to Israel. Um, but I believe that, he, that Joel is comforting the hearts of the people by pointing to a time in the future when Israel's fortunes will be restored in a literal way for a unique period of time in which Christ will reign physically and there will be blessing in Israel as well as for all of God's people around the world before the final culmination in the end. That will be the day of the Lord when Christ returns. Verse 19, Egypt shall become a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness for the violence done to the people of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. 
but Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. Again, these promises to me fall flat in a purely spiritual fulfillment. Verse 21, I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So there's the entire book of Joel. We got through it all and we're only uh, two minutes over. And so I believe that this is a book about God's sovereign reign over natural disasters, national disasters, and even that great day of the Lord in the end when God finishes his judgment and salvation upon the earth. Um, Let me pray for us to conclude, and uh, and then we'll stick around if you have any questions. Father, we thank you for this wonderful short book of Joel packed with beautiful truth, Lord. I pray that as we read it, it would comfort our hearts to know that there's nothing that we can endure here at a personal level, at a family level, at a national level, or a global level that is not part of your good and gracious plan. Father, you have promised to work all things together for the good of those who love you or are called according to your purpose. We know, Father, that the end is in your hands, that you have planned the end. You see the end from the beginning. You are at the end because you're outside of time. And so we can trust you both now and forever, even with our eternal soul. Father, strengthen us to do that better and better so that our trust in you for eternity would change the way that we serve you day by day. Father, we thank you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.